Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Beirut's airstrike. AP reports an apparent Israeli airstrike on central Beirut in the early hours of this morning. It follows sustained attacks across Lebanon over the weekend, including one which killed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Chinese shares are set to enter a bull market with authorities rolling out fresh property easing steps as part of a raft of stimulus measures. Plus, Dubai's position as a financial hub seems to be going from strength to strength. We discuss the influx of hedge funds and money managers following a private wealth boom with the DIFC authority later this hour. Well, it's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Brissetchi in Dubai, a seminal weekend over here in the Middle East. We're going to get right to it in a moment, discussing uh, what the killing of Hassan Nasrallah means, not just for Lebanon, but for broader regional politics. But before we get to that, let's just talk about some of the market price action that we've had. And even though we saw a slight negative close for Wall Street on Friday with the S&P and Nasdaq dipping slightly into the red, uh, the theme of the week continues to be one of that positivity coming through from China. And as you can see behind me, today we've got the S&P futures not doing a lot, leading sideways, and NASDAQ as well. But the handover from CSI from China, that index up 6%. We are up more than 22% just in the last three trading sessions. So a lot of the green on the screen, the catalyst, is coming from China. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I also want to draw your attention to what's happening in the energy complex. Just sitting around $72 now, Brent, up about half a percent. And this has been this ongoing uh, talk of war between some of the supply pressures that are coming through, posing downside risks to the energy complex versus the geopolitical risks that keep flaring up in the region. Uh, and a note put out by Goldman Sachs overnight, interesting, saying that for now, there doesn't appear to be any uh, supply disruption coming through from Iran, which is why, for the most part, most of these geopolitical concerns have been brushed off. Uh, and they say that they expect Brent complex to stay in the $70 to $80 range in anticipation of extra OPEC plus supply coming. So again, the focus continues to be on China demand signals, the non-OPEC supply outlook, and the geopolitical risk that is getting priced into the energy complex. But let's go back to the main story for markets, and that is what has been happening in some of these markets in Asia. Yvonne Mann is in Hong Kong. Yvonne, just give us the latest. Uh, we are seeing a massive rally across Chinese indices today. Yeah, it continues for another day. It's the eve of the Golden Week holiday, so it's the last day before markets are shut for five straight days. So we're going into this holiday with the bang here. The key question is, what happens after those five days, right? Can this party continue? And certainly there's some that are flagging that this exuberance could be overdone. But nevertheless, we're still seeing some punchy gains here this morning. You talked about the CSI 300 close to entering into that bull market here. H shares, HSCEI, China listed ones, uh, uh, Hong Kong listed Chinese companies now seeing 12 straight days of gains. Five days off could be seem like an attorney for a lot of traders, and we're looking to see the Golden Week holiday. Will we see an actual spur of consumption activity? Will be people be heading out to buying property? That's going to be the key thing to watch these next few days. You take a look at how everything else beyond just Chinese assets, though. Take a look at iron ore in Singapore. It is surging here right now on the back of more stimulus that came through over the weekend, in particular when it came to first-tier cities. The first time we're seeing Guangzhou, for example, remove all restrictions when it comes to home purchases. You saw Shanghai, Shenzhen following through not quite all restrictions, but at least easing more. And that certainly is helping the likes of iron ore. We're back to 112 for the Singapore future. CGB yields, we did see a melt up. That's pairing back a little bit, but still, it seems like that floor around 2% for the Chinese 10 year yield has been met, according to some. And you're seeing that divergence when it comes to Japanese equities. That surprise win from the uh, Shibu uh, Ishiga there, uh, it certainly is one, Ishiba, I should say, is sending a bit of a shockwave there for Japanese equities. The yen surged, we're pairing back a bit, but yes, stocks are faltering here, given his stance supporting the BOJ when it comes to normalization. Jumana. Mm -hmm. Something uh, worth noting as well uh, in Japan there, quite a big move in the Nikkei, it's on 4% on the back of the political news. Yvonne, thank you so much for giving us the latest. That, that was Yvonne Mann in Hong Kong. Our top story this morning, the killing of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in an airstrike on southern Beirut on Friday has dealt a major blow to the group and its sponsor, Iran. Attacks continued over the weekend, with the Associated Press reporting Israel carried out its first strike in the heart of Beirut on Monday. 
Israeli forces say they also bombed a seaport and several power stations in Yemen on Sunday following attacks on central Israel by Houthi rebels. At the UN General Assembly on Friday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed to press ahead with the fight against Hezbollah in Lebanon, casting doubts on an international push for a ceasefire and whether it will be realized. I have a message for the tyrants of Tehran. If you strike us, we will strike you. There is no place. There is no place in Iran that the long arm of Israel cannot reach. Also just worth pointing out that that speech took place before the airstrike occurred that uh, took out Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, let's discuss this with uh, Bloomberg's UAE bureau chief Dana Khresh. Uh, well, um, a significant event, a significant weekend uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah was a figure who loomed large over not only Lebanese politics but regional politics, uh, politics over the uh, last four decades or so. First of all, how significant is his killing? And also, what has the reaction been from um, other members in the so-called axis of resistance? It is definitely the biggest blow to Iran's uh, foreign policy that is that rests on a network of proxies that it has trained, armed, financed for decades now. Um, it is even, I would say and argue, worse than the killing of Qasem Soleimani. It was Nasrallah who rose to that challenge um, and filled the vacuum left by Soleimani for the proxy groups. Um, Hezbollah amended ties between Iran and Hamas, between Syria and Hamas, and deepened this network. He was personally close to a lot of these groups around the region. And you know, and I mean, reportedly, um, Hezbollah even trained Houthi rebels in Yemen. And you see the Houthi leader in some of his televised speeches resembling a lot of Nasrallah, his attitude, the way he speaks. Um, and so almost kind of a copy of the group. Mm -hmm. So Nasrallah had a powerful influence. So Hezbollah was not just powerful militarily, but influential in the region, especially with these proxy groups. So his absence will definitely have an impact on them morale-wise um, and, of course, militarily and guidance from him. And, of course, this is Israel almost regaining that confidence it lost during the October 7 attack, right? Regaining that image of being the strongest army in the region um, that was severely hit with the October 7 attack when Hamas militants invaded. So Hezbollah over the last couple of weeks has taken many hits. Uh, there was the initial, the device explosions that injured, critically injured 3,000 more plus operatives. And then you've had the killing of Hassan Nasrallah alongside many other senior commanders as well. So what we're looking at today is a really debilitated Hezbollah. The real question that everyone's asking is whether Iran is going to show up in a meaningful capacity and support Hezbollah's regrouping efforts. What are we hearing from Iran right now? So, so far, the reactions have been all rhetoric, right? They were saying, we will retaliate, this is not something we will be silent um, over. Or we saw yesterday also from Iranian officials saying, if the international community is not going to hold Israel accountable, then we will do this. Um, and Khamenei himself, um, the supreme leader a few, a few months ago, and after a few weeks ago, and after Haniyeh's killing, he said it is okay to take a tactical um, retreat from uh, the fight with, with Israel. So Iran is in a very difficult position because now Israel is going after every single um, of its major figures, right? So it's Nasrallah, so it's Haniyi. And in Tehran, that message was that we can go after you anywhere in the world, especially in Iran, if you think, that, if you think that's safe enough, safe enough. So there is a big fear of what Israel's reaction would be. Um, and it's even now, after Nasrallah's killing, is still relentless airstrikes on Lebanon, and it hasn't stopped. And the question is, when does Israel think Hezbollah is dismantled, destroyed enough to, of course, stop the attacks. Yeah, and that's a question I'll put to our next guest, uh, Bloomberg's UAE Bureau Chief Dana Khrish. Thank you very much for giving us the overview. Let's bring in Mehran Kamarava, Professor of Government at Georgetown University, Qatar. Good morning to you. Uh, let me just put the same question that Dana ended her segment on, which is, uh, at what point do you think Israel will have viewed Hezbollah as sufficiently degraded uh, so that this effort and this war objective, the new war objective in the north, uh, will have deemed to be complete? 
Well, there are strategic objectives that Israel has, and there are political objectives that Netanyahu has. And the two cannot be uh, separated from one another. Netanyahu has a vested interest in continuing and expanding uh, the genocide in Gaza now to Lebanon, not just southern Lebanon, but to central Beirut, uh, in order to prolong his own political career. I think as a military strategy, to think that Israel can destroy or get rid of Hezbollah is really not realistic. It's not realistic by any stretch of imagination. But politically, of course, it serves an incredibly useful uh, phenomenon for Netanyahu and the right flank of uh, his cabinet. Now, I was reading reports over the weekend about a wedge that is opening up within Iran. Uh, you've got, on one hand, the more moderates espoused by President Pazeshkian. And even if you look at his speech to the UN General Assembly last week, it was one that was more conciliatory towards the West, uh, potentially reaching out to do something about the removal of the sanctions that have crippled the Iranian economy, uh, restart negotiations over their nuclear plants. So that's the stance coming from the president. And then equally, you've got the more hardliner members of the IRGC who are pushing for, again, a more forceful response to Israel and over the killing of Hassan Nasrallah. What, what is going on in Iran exactly? And is this tumult at Iranian leadership level trickling down to the decision making uh, when it comes to the likes of whether or not they should go in and fully support Hezbollah militarily in their efforts to regroup? I think you're absolutely right that there is a robust debate right now going on uh, within Iran, and particularly within the Supreme Ma National Security Council, which is in charge of security and overall foreign policy making of the country. I sincerely doubt, however, if that robust debate is going to manifest itself in some sort of policy paralysis. Historically, what we've seen from Iran is a remarkable degree of pragmatism. And the president himself said in New York, in fact, that Iran has refused so far to fall for the bait that Israel has uh, laid for it and, and to bite the, uh, uh, go, go for the trap that Israel has laid for it. And so I think what we see is what the Iranians have called and uh, will continue to call so-called strategic patience. As long as Israel doesn't attack Iran directly, I think Iran is very unlikely to be involved. Remember that Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, Iraqi militia are part of Iran's forward defense meant so that the next war is not fought on Iranian soil, not necessarily part of an offensive strategy for Tehran. And so I think uh, unless and until we see an Israeli attack on Iranian targets, uh, I don't think we'll see Iran being directly involved in any meaningful way. Mm, and yet, if this is a war of intelligence, Iran and the axis of resistance, uh, so to speak, have been losing. They're on the losing end of this war of intelligence, starting with the killing of Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran, with uh, the devices explosions in Beirut last week, with the killing, the, the targeted killing of Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, it seems as though if this were purely a war of intelligence, uh, Iran is on the back foot. Absolutely. And uh, no doubt that Iran has suffered one humiliating intelligence defeat after another, beginning with the killing of uh, Hania in Tehran uh, as a guest of the Iranian government, attending the inauguration of the uh, president. And then, of course, the walkie-talkies and before that, the pagers and now the uh, killing of um, Hassan Nasrallah. But I think uh, from Tehran's perspective, they're playing the long game. They want to see Israel surrounded in the north by Hezbollah, by, uh, in Gaza by Hamas, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, on its eastern flank by Syria. And so Iran has been trying to play the long game. And of course, uh, it uh, wins some, loses some, just as Israel has been winning the latest round. But of course, uh, there are also strategic losses uh, in Israel's part as well. 
Marin Kamarava, always good to talk to you. Professor of Government at Georgetown University, Qatar. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, coming up, hear why Macrovisor says we are back in the era of easy money. More on their investment strategy next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Chinese stocks surged after China's largest cities eased rules for home buyers in an effort to tackle its property crisis. Meanwhile, shares in Tokyo fell after news of Shigeru Ishiba's surprise victory in the LPD leadership race. So it is a, a story of, of two sides, a tale of two halves. We've got the Nikkei down 4.6% today, while the CSI index in China is up 6.2%. Let's bring in Macrovisor co-founder Ayesha Tarek. Uh, actually, let's just pick up with these moves that we've had in China over the last week. Has it been a big catalyst for markets? Uh, CSI up something more than 20% just in three days of trading. Do you see this as a dead cat bounce or the beginning of something more sustained? Good morning, Jamana. Thank you for having me back. So very interesting things going on in the market and something that, you know, we've been talking about for a while now about China, you know, bringing in the stimulus packages and things like that. So uh, what's interesting is they actually did a lot of targeted measures towards the stock market. So to your point, whether it's a dead cap bounce or not, I don't think it really is at this stage. I think this can continue for the next maybe two to three months, maybe, until things start to change again. Now, the monetary policies that they're stating, um, they're good. Uh, we're very un encouraging, but as you know, they always work with a lag. So it's mm. going to take a little bit of time for that to sort of set in. And I think on the fiscal side, we're still lacking a little bit. So it remains to be mm. seen, but I think this rally could continue for the next two to three months, maybe. How pivotal is it that international investors, the likes of Appaloosa's David Tepper, saying that this is a quote-unquote buy-everything moment for Chinese stocks? It's caught the attention of the international community. It has, and I actually watched his interview. <laughs> it was very interesting. He was very gung-ho about everything. Yeah. Now, I see his point because he's talking about valuations there, right? And China is sort of, you know, the valuations have bottomed there. So I think the market has put in a bottom. I don't think that, so even though we may you know, have fits and starts to this rally, mm. I don't think we go back down to, you know, the bottom where we were. Um, but again, uh, it always pays to be cautious with China. Yeah. Um, after everything that's happened in the last two to three years, we still need to get out of this debt deflation spiral before we can see a sustained recovery for the economy. Yeah. What about the price action that we're seeing in commodities? Uh, iron ore up more than 10 percent today. Copper seeing a bit of a rebound as well. And of course, these are core commodities that uh, China uh, uh, rely on, uh, especially with the transition uh, to the new economy, copper versus yes. old economy, iron ore. Uh, do you think that this, again, rally in commodities will have legs? Um, so, well, they're having their day in the sun, at least, yeah. that's for sure. Um, I, I think, yes, we could see a bit of a rally here. And mm. that's not just because of China, by the way. Um, I think you read my note, and my first statement was we're back in the era of easy money, yeah. right? And I think with the Fed easing and the, most of the central banks easing, I think, yes, we could see a sustained rally in commodities yeah. for a while. But yeah. we're not quite yet in the era of easy money in the U.S. They've only cut 50 basis points. It's still a long way to go. How pivotal are the numbers this Friday going to be for market direction from here, NFP? So I think every number from here on end is kind of pivotal, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but I think the Fed's done what they've done. I doubt they deliver another 50 basis points cut, but don't quote me on that because I was wrong the last <laughs> time as well. I didn't it's expect too bad a 50. you're on the record now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, truth be told, um, I, I think they've delivered that big jumbo cut. They've set the stage for aggressive, mm. you know, cuts along the way. Mm. They are they're, they're saying they're going to do two more this year, which is quite aggressive, right? So we have 100 basis points this year, 100 basis points next year. 
I think that's, you know, uh, mm. pretty aggressive enough for mm. them to sort of tell people or reassure people that they're not behind mm. the curve anymore. And Aisha, very quickly, uh, we spent, you know, the last week covering the geopolitical events in the region because things have really taken a step for the worse. Uh, how closely are market participants watching what's happening over here? So I think they're watching it, but I don't think they're reacting much to it. I think, you know, it's lost a little bit of its uh, luster, for lack of a better word, you know. Uh, this thing has been going on for a while now, and um, I, I don't think that... So markets have probably already priced in that risk. Yeah. So it's not like a lot of focus on it. Yeah, yeah, certainly appears to be the case. Always good to chat to you. Macrovisor co-founder Aisha Tariq, thank you very much. Well, still ahead, Kenya's biggest telco says it is not blocking Musk's Starlink from operating in the country. We hear from the CEO a bit later in the show. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Bloomberg has learned Beijing is ramping up pressure on local firms to buy domestic AI chips instead of NVIDIA products in a bid to expand its own semiconductor industry and counter U.S. sanctions. Sources say the policy has taken the form of guidance rather than an outright ban to avoid escalating tensions and handicapping startups. NVIDIA shares extended declines Friday after the Bloomberg report. Bloomberg sources say the EU is planning to vote on Friday on whether to impose tariffs on Chinese-made EVs. Member states have received a draft of the regulation, which could impose tariffs as high as 45 percent. Europe says China unfairly subsidizes its EV industry, but Beijing denies unfair practices and has threatened retaliatory tariffs. Both sides are still discussing a negotiated solution. SpaceX has started its mission to bring home two astronauts stuck in orbit after technical failures with Boeing's Starliner capsule. Its Dragon Crew 9 capsule has docked with the International Space Station, carrying an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut. The spacecraft also had two empty seats that NASA astronauts Barry Wilmore and Sunita Williams will fill when the group returns to Earth next year. And a quick look at equity futures as we head to the break. Uh, positive momentum coming through from the China session overnight. S&P futures, though, not doing much. Uh, leaning towards the green up five basis points. NASDAQ not doing a lot either. As we head into the European session, your stock futures seen up 14 basis points. But up next, we're going to be discussing Dubai's position as a financial hub as the city sees a private banking boom. Don't miss our conversation with the DIFC authority. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Beirut airstrike. AP reports an apparent Israeli airstrike on central Beirut in the early hours of this morning. It follows sustained attacks across Lebanon over the weekend, including one which killed Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Chinese shares are set to enter a bull market, with authorities rolling out fresh property easing steps as part of a raft of stimulus measures. Plus, Dubai's position as a financial hub seems to be going from strength to strength. We discuss the influx of hedge funds and money managers following a private wealth boom with the DIFC authority shortly. It has just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Bersacci in Dubai, picking up on a slightly weaker close for Wall Street on Friday with both the S&P and Nasdaq slipping moderately. NVIDIA pulling back the Nasdaq index. Uh, some of the declines in semiconductor stocks also weighing on the tech index. Uh, and over, uh, well, looking ahead to this week, the focus is going to be on that NFP number on Friday to get more clues about the health of the U.S. economy. But the other big story that we've been talking about over the course of the last week has 
has been those huge raft of stimulus measures coming through from China. We've seen a big boost to Chinese equities. You can see overnight the handover from CSI 6.2 percent higher just on today's session. It's up more than 20 percent over the course of the last three sessions. So whether that also transpires into the U.S. session remains a question for market. But as you can see, these futures aren't doing much here. They're pretty much leaning sideways. Also some focus on the energy complex. Brent sitting at a $72 handle now. We are up half a percent. So on the, on the positive, you've got uh, these better demand signals coming out from China and perhaps uh, somewhat of a geopolitical premium being priced into the energy complex. On the flip side, you continue to get downward pressure coming from the supply and extra stockpiles sitting in the system. So uh, energy market uh, traders are, are navigating those two uh, headwinds uh, to the energy complex. But for now, let's also talk more about what is happening in Asia. Yvonne Mann is in Hong Kong getting a, giving us a closer look at what has been happening with some of these key indices, a major rally. Yeah, you're taking a look at that bull market territory when it comes to CSI 300. You look at just turnover overall in Shenzhen in Shanghai today, and we're seeing another day of more than a trillion renminbi of stock turnover here. And in fact, you take a look at how today's trading volume is concerned. I mean, turnover is already the highest we've seen in over three years, and we've still got a few hours to go for the rest of the day. It's interesting how narrative has really shifted, right? And you're seeing more and more analysts compare what we're seeing in this equity rally to what we saw when China basically uh, really closed and shut down their uh, COVID restrictions and opened the economy once again back in November of 2022. They say it really feels like that, that there's that urgency from policymakers and then a very quick U-turn when it comes to policy. That's why we're seeing, as we get close to that Golden Week holiday, another day of parabolic gains. And you focus really on, we talked about iron ore, the, uh, the miners, the consumption plays once again. These were long seen as the laggers. Uh, in this equity market, continuing to see things like JD.com, China Wanka, China Tourism Group are surging. If you can flip the board here right now and just take a look at some of these stock moves as well. So China Tourism Group, you know, there is this bet that people are going to be loosening their purse strings during this holiday. 26% gains for that stock. China Wanka, the property store, given that top three of the first tier cities are loosening restrictions. Property is certainly catching a bit here this morning. And you have the likes of Michael Hartnett from Bank of America saying, look, you're starting to see that rotation out of the U.S. into international stocks. The unloved commodities like industrial metals, for example, here, as we start to see more of these stimulus measures. And if, if that Chinese 10 year yield can maintain that floor, of 2%, Jumana. Yeah, Yvonne, thank you so much for bringing us the latest. Yvonne Mann in Hong Kong. Now let's return to our top story this morning and the latest developments in the Middle East. AP reports Israel conducted an airstrike on central Beirut in the early hours this morning. It's first in the nearly year-long conflict, killing at least one person and wounding 16 others. Elsewhere, Israeli strikes also hit Houthi targets in Yemen, ramping up the challenge to Iran following the killing of Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah in southern Beirut. Lebanon's prime minister says a humanitarian crisis is unfolding in his country as one million people are forced from their homes. Bloomberg's Dan Williams joins us now from Jerusalem. Uh, Dan, uh, thanks for joining us today. So uh, Israel's code name for the operation to kill Hassan Nasrallah was new order, reflecting a belief that perhaps this could mark a major turnaround. Has it from the perspective of Israel? Well, the most immediate change we've seen is a significant petering off of Hezbollah rocket missile attacks on Israel, which would appear to be consistent with Israel's claim that it has degraded the Hezbollah military and effectively plunged the entire organization into chaos with the decapitation of its leadership. Now, why is this significant regionally? Because Israel sees Hezbollah as not just part of the Iranian axis in the Middle East, axis being the group of uh, um, allied militiamen, um, the Assad regime uh, led or, um, or uh, uh, orchestrated by Iran against uh, uh, Israel and other um, forces in the Middle East. Israel actually sees Hezbollah, specifically the late Hassan Nasrallah, as the central part of that axis. So from Israel's telling, it would appear that it believes it has effectively broken the back of this axis in the Middle East, having started with Hamas in the Gaza Strip, then moved to Hezbollah. And now the question is, what comes next? 
Yeah, well, in terms of what comes next, there have been airstrikes in Yemen uh, directed at, at, at Houthis, um, given the uh, attempted airstrike from Houthis into Tel Aviv over the weekend. So just talk us through the significance of what is happening there as well. Well, that um, Houthi launch against Israel, um, not by coincidence, happened just as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was landing at Ben Gurion Airport on his return, his rushed return, from the United Nations General Assembly, as the world learned that while in New York, he had actually ordered the killing of Hassan Nasrallah. As he landed, I was on the plane with him. Um, just after he disembarked, there were sirens in the airport, other parts of central Israel, and it emerged that Houthis had launched a surface-to-surface -surface missile at the airport. It was shot down by Israel over Jerusalem. But nonetheless, the Houthis, I think, were trying to relay a message in their name and in the name of the Iranian Axis that they were still fighting. What followed yesterday was the second Israeli airstrike so far in this war, in fact, so far ever, against the Yemeni target by its warplanes, uh, Hudayda port, which is under Houthi control. And unlike July 20th, it appears that the, uh, the target set was expanded. It appears that Israel has shown the Yemenis, and not just the Yemenis, Iran as well, that it has the capacity to send a significant strike package some 1,800 kilometers away. Keep in mind that many Iranian targets are actually closer than that target, than Hodeida port, that Israel is capable of sending a strike package that far and delivering potentially a strategic blow. Yeah. Uh, and let's just quickly also talk about the domestic politics as well. Some big news broke yesterday evening. The Israeli prime minister has brought in a longtime rival, Gideon Saar, into the government. How should we be reading that, Dan? Well, Netanyahu, he's a war leader, but he's also a very canny politician. And his political standing in Israel has been suffering, certainly at the outset of the war. Uh, it began with a Hezbollah attack that blindsided all of Israel, including so-called Mr. Security, is how um, the prime minister has uh, styled himself. So I think he's been trying to redesign himself quickly, shore up his sagging support, and this would help him politically. It's expanded his conservative religious nationalist coalition such that he has more stability in parliament against any attempt to topple him with a, con uh, a motion of no confidence. It may actually reflect upon his planned conduct of the war because should he, for example, choose to enter a Gaza truce with Hamas, a truce under which Israel would recover hostages, he would face significant opposition from far-right members of the coalition, potentially even threatened walkouts of the coalition. So having brought these extra members in, he's actually buttressed himself against the potential threat from the far-right. There is also a potential attempt here to cultivate a, a successor to his defense minister, Yoav Gallant, their relationship has been strained, and there is some talk about Gideon Saar eventually mm. taking the reins of the defense minister once he has a bit more experience in cabinet. Yeah, yeah we'll keep an, an eye on the developments uh, domestically as well. Bloomberg's Dan Williams in Jerusalem. Thank you so much for the report. Now, let's turn to this week's Mideast Money segment, focusing on Dubai's position as a global financial hub. The city has long been a key focal point for the world's wealthiest people and largest firms, and this has only strengthened in the past few years. A Henley & Partners report finds Dubai is home to more than 200 centimillionaires, placing the city top in the region and 15th worldwide. Dubai's deep pool of private wealth is a big draw for firms. However, the city faces competition, not just globally, but from neighboring Abu Dhabi, as well as Saudi Arabia, when it comes to talent, firms, and wealth. For more on the recent changes the DIFC has seen, uh, let's bring in Salman Jaffrey, Chief Business Development Officer at the DIFC Authority. Wonderful to have you with us on the show today. So Dubai DIFC has increasingly become uh, a hub for wealth managers, asset managers. We hear more of, uh, of hedge funds moving over as well. Uh, what do you think is the catalyst for that? What do you boil it down to? Well, Jamana, it's great to be here. In real estate, they say it's all about location, location, location. I think the, uh, the relevant, uh, appropriate anal uh, analogy here is people, people, people. Mm. There has been an unprecedented inflow of talent into Dubai, uh, particularly post-COVID. Dubai has always been a fantastic place for senior global talent in financial services, and DIFC has a pretty unparalleled track record. But really, in the last five years or so, the, the number and quality of uh, financial services people, including bankers, 
and senior asset managers and portfolio managers coming into Dubai is, is absolutely unprecedented. Yeah. yeah. My colleagues uh, wrote a story last week saying that uh, the hedge fund industry now alone employs more than 1,000 people in IFC, the likes of Beliazny, Millennium. Do you see that number, that 1,000 number, as a particular milestone? And how do you plan to keep that number growing? Yeah, it's a good number. It reflects the inclusion of some uh, you know, world-class firms. You mentioned some of them, whether it's Millennium, Baliazny, QRT, Tudor, Eisler, the list continues. We're seeing uh, a significant inflow of that talent, the pipeline for those firms uh, and others in the asset management space continues. And I think what's really interesting about that number is, unlike a few years ago, it comprises a very significant number of people who are deploying capital out of the region, as opposed to simply being frontline salespeople or relationship managers. And I think that's a welcome development for DIFC in Dubai and the region. Mm. When you think about the ecosystem, how much of a draw is it the fact that you have so many ultra wealth, high net worth individuals residing in the UAE? Do you think that that is, again, one of the draws for all of these money managers moving here? You're absolutely correct. I think there's three things happening. I think uh, the story of um, sovereign funds in the region, 40 plus of them, is well known. Yeah. When you add to that, the incredible sophistication, increasing sophistication of local uh, regional family offices and pools of private capital. That's a really, really important trend. And then upon that, you add a third kind of inflow of ultra high net worth individuals. You alluded to Henley and Partners report of 72,000 mm. millionaires, 212 centimillionaires. I should add 15 plus billionaires also. You put that together with the managers and you have uh, the region's uh, largest and deepest and thriving ecosystem for wealth. Yeah. Let me just ask you, because your title is Chief Business Development Officer for DIFC, what is your five-year plan for the DIFC? Well, the five-year plan is embedded in our enterprise strategy, which is called the Future of Finance, where we will do uh, at least two things. One is we will continue to deepen the core, which is this incredible base of uh, financial services depth that we have. I should add, by the way, for those of you who don't know, the population of the DIFC has doubled to over 45,000 in three years, and we're over 6,500 companies. So maintaining that depth remains uh, very, very important for us. And the second thing we'll continue to do is we'll continue to invest in innovation, which includes fintech and, of course, uh, artificial intelligence. Mm. Those two pillars comprise the future of finance, which is our objective. Yeah, so you talk about the uh, demand uh, doubling in the last few years. Does DIFC have the capacity to accommodate all of this demand? Are you thinking of expanding in terms of buildings and infrastructure to accommodate? Well, it's always a good problem to have when you have incredible demand and inflows from around the world. And of course, we spend a lot of time tracking the demand and making sure that, re that our clients have innovative new real estate products as well as new capacity. And so, yeah, the answer, the short mm -hmm. answer is that we have uh, significant new expansion plans uh, that will start to come online the end of last year, uh, the end of next year, rather, excuse me, into mm -hmm. the coming three or four years. And how do you think about the rivalry with the likes of uh, Abu Dhabi, ADGM, some hedge funds choosing to locate over there? Brevin Howard, for example, has a meaningful presence in Abu Dhabi. Riyadh also making a big push as well to lure some international companies to make Riyadh their headquarters. How do you think about the, the regional rivalry that's coming through? Well, Jumana, as a principal, as you know, uh, Dubai, uh, the, the ethos of Dubai and DIFC is certainly very pro-competition. Competition brings great outcomes for clients. Um, I can tell you that our pipeline continues and uh, we get uh, the very top uh, uh, hedge fund clients coming here. I should add that we have now 63 hedge fund clients, pure play hedge fund clients, 44 of which exceed the $1 billion AUM mark. So mm. uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, the demand for this particular platform remains strong and will continue to be very strong. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us on our show. Fascinating to hear your insights on where the DIFC is going in the next few years. Excellent. That was Salman Jaffrey, Chief Business Development Officer at the DIFC Authority. Well, for more on these stories looking into the intersection of wealth and power in the region, sign up for our Mideast Money newsletter on Bloomberg.com. And coming up, Kenya's biggest telco is in talks with Elon Musk's Starlink. We hear from the Safaricom CEO next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. The CEO of Kenya's biggest telco, Safaricom, says the company is in talks with Elon Musk Starlink and other satellite providers on potential future partnerships. Peter Ndegwa told us his firm is not seeking to block Starlink in the East African nation, calling that a regulatory decision. I think there's misconception about Safaricom getting in the way. We do not. Ha we are not the regulator. Mm. Uh, we we had expressed our views uh, about um, uh, how the, the the regulator should ensure that industry players express their views about how this is in terms of industry participation. Uh, public participation is enshrined in the constitution. Mm. So that, that is the point rather than because we have the capacity or in any way we do not have the ability uh, to prevent uh, uh, anyone from operating in Kenya. That is a regulatory decision. But could that potentially put Safaricom's um, dominance in the market at risk if, if Starlink was uh, allowed to operate in the market? I wouldn't call it dominance. We've been we've been successful because we've been investing in that in Kenya for a very long time. Mm. Uh, many many people don't realize actually we got licenses all around the same time mm. across the industry. Uh, we 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 invest. Uh, just between 300 and 350 million dollars every year uh, to expand infrastructure, to continue to, to create access. So, so for us, is it also sharpens our ability to compete. Hmm. Uh, I don't think. I, I think the most important is to make sure there's a level playing field. Hmm. We are a local company that has been very successful. Hmm. Uh, we pay a billion dollars of taxes every year. Uh, we are the largest uh, listed business on the stock exchange. So clearly, we have a voice. And we need to ensure that that, that, that voice is heard. Mm. But we do not want to limit consumer choice mm. or customer choice. In do you any think way. that's what Starlink would potentially bring in? Uh, I, I think it is just the choice in terms of the type of technology they are providing. Mm. Remember that uh, uh, 4G coverage is more than 95% in the country. Fiberization is actually one of the best in, in, the, in the region. So the satellite adds and complements the rest of the technology that are, that are available. But what I would, uh, 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 what we are actually kind of expressing to the regulator is that I think it's important that satellite is also used, especially in places which are not covered today. Mm. Uh, because that will benefit the country. At the end of the day, it's about uh, what we are, bene uh, the, 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 rather than purely just competing in urban areas. And there's nothing wrong with competing in urban areas. Yeah. But, but I think it is important that uh, we, we, we have uh, an environment where uh, satellite is, in, is uh, complements what already exists. But we are not, we are not uh, worried about competition. We, we'll deal with it. We, uh, yeah. at, at the end of the day, it's about giving customers what they want. Well, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's chief Africa correspondent, Jennifer Zabazaja, uh, who, who spoke to uh, Safaricom CEO last week. What else came through from your conversation, Jen? Right, Jumana, this is uh, very fascinating because really what's been played out over the past few uh, weeks and months is that it has been Safaricom versus Elon Musk's Starlink. Uh, and uh, really what was pretty enlightening from what Peter was saying is that that is a narrative that is not necessarily true, as he was alluding to there. Uh, for for context, uh, it's it's not Starlink necessarily that has taken, or excuse me, it's not Safaricom that has taken Starlink to court. It is actually a local provider who is saying that Safaricom is potentially blo blocking Starlink from coming in. Uh, but what Peter was getting to is really that the, the the need for the country is more connectivity more broadly. So not just in urban areas, in more rural areas. And that is really where uh, we are seeing a lot of the um, Kenyans and local people uh, not being connected. And so that's why he was saying potentially there's an opportunity for them to partner together. Uh, but it's uh, the onus is on the regulator then to set those terms and to set those limits. And he said there is no distinction between what uh, the Safaricom is asking for versus what other telcos have asked for uh, in other markets more globally. So it was a very fascinating conversation. Jen, thank you so much. Bloomberg's chief Africa correspondent, Jennifer Zabazaja. And coming up, iron ore spikes as China's biggest cities ease curbs on home buying. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg.
iron ore is surging this morning after three of China's biggest cities ease restrictions on home buying. That's boosting the demand outlook for the major commodity up almost 10 percent today in trading. Let's bring in Andrew Jaynes, Asia Energy and Commodities Editor in Singapore. So just talk us through the price action today, substantial moves in the price of iron ore. Hi, Jumana. Yeah, it's been dramatic, up almost 11% at one point, and that's after an 11% gain uh, last week. Uh, this has all been generated by this massive sort of stimulus package that China released last week, and then there were more details over the weekend with the cities relaxing home buying, the central bank moving to lower mortgage rates. It does look potentially prone to a bit of a pullback, though, because it's going to depend on, you know, will, will these moves turn around the property market and China's been trying to do this for quite a long time so I think it really remains to be seen whether um, iron ore can sustain these pretty dramatic gains. Yeah and that is going to be a big question what about positioning right now? Um, yeah well the the steel industry in, cri in China is in a crisis. Uh, they've been warning that this is the worst since a couple of really bad periods around the great financial crisis and then in 2015. Um, so whether, whether those steel mills, whether this is enough for those steel mills to, to step up production again and that de for that demand yeah. to flow through to iron ore, that, that's the big question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bloomberg's uh, Andrew Jaynes in Singapore, thank you very much for talking us through some of the price action in iron ore today. That was it for our show, Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.